Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Eileen Caldwell. I'm one of the board members here at FinFest USA. Um, we're really excited to have you join us today. I personally have been looking forward to this webinar for a long time. Um, so we're all very excited to learn about um, traditional weaving practices. Um, as I put in the chat, I'm coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, I've been on the board for six years now and um, it's just been really great. So thank you all for joining us and I'm gonna hand it back over to um, Marcus and he will take it away. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Marcus Cedarstrom. I'm a folklorist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and super excited to be co-hosting today's presentation uh, alongside uh, UW folklorist Anna Roo. Um, we're going to be hearing from Lisa today with her presentation from Rags to Rugs, My Grandmother's Loom. Um, and for those of you joining us for the first time as part of this second year-long virtual FinFest, welcome. Um, next year, we're back in person in Duluth, uh, which should be a lot of fun. Um, so I want to thank, obviously, FinFest for organizing this uh, wonderful series, but also the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures at UW-Madison uh, and the Sustaining Scandinavian Folk Arts in the Upper Midwest Project, um, also at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, super excited to have so many people here supporting FinFest in this virtual series. Uh, this is the third of four in the Finnish American Folk Arts series part of FinFest this year. Uh, on Saturday, October 29th at 11 a.m. Central, um, we're going to be welcoming Sayalena Ranthanen, um, presenting Finnish North American working class women and music in the early 20th century. Uh, but today we're hearing about rag rugs. Uh, this is a live program held on the Zoom webinar platform. So that means that the presenters, we, uh, can't see or hear the audience. Um, and that the audience members, you all, can't see or hear each other. However, we do have time for questions at the end, uh, and you'll be able to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. And you can also type things into the chat. Uh, it'll be easier for us if you have a specific question, if you pop it into the question and answer um, using that question and answer button at the bottom. We are recording, you all know that already, uh, and we'll be putting this up on YouTube and sharing it there. Uh, and through the FinFest website. So I do this every time, um, but I, I ask everyone to kind of take a moment to think about place uh, as we talk today about tradition and home and family. Uh, I work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and that's on Ho-Chunk land. And, and I mention that, I say that to acknowledge where we are, uh, but also to acknowledge that we can't I like literally cannot tell the story of immigration. We can't tell our history, our heritage. We can't tell stories of family and friends without understanding where we came from, where we are, who came before us, and who will come after us. So as we gather today online here uh, from places across the country and the globe, we ask that you kind of take a moment to think about the people who are in the place you currently live. Think about those who are kin to you and those who aren't. Think about how the land has changed over time, um, how it has changed with you. Uh, these connections we have with family and friends and, and place, they help shape who we are and help shape the place that we live in today. So embrace that, reflect on that. Um, and hopefully in the coming days, I would ask you to reach out to many of the amazing organizations doing work in your area to sustain that history and that heritage and to tell these really interesting uh, stories of immigration and indigeneity. Um, and with that, I want to introduce Lisa. Uh, so Lisa lives in her 117-year-old restored childhood home up in Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, she's a collector of family stories, artifacts, heirlooms, and her former bedroom is now home to her grandmother's Union 36 rug loom. So her grandmother's loom has played an outsized role in her life, uh, and it was actually on that loom that she learned to weave rag rugs. She's an accomplished weaver. She's also a writer and a family historian, and has put together a really wonderful presentation for us, tying together the past and the present. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa as she takes it away. Thanks for being here, Lisa. 
Oh, oh, Lisa, you're muted. <laughs> you're you're muted. I think you have to mute from your computer there. Unmute. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Okay. All yep. right. So yes, I said bye bye to everyone. And and before um, I jump into my my spiel here, I, the first thing I want to do is show you my mug from FinFest USA back when it was in Hancock, Michigan, 1985. And uh, I was 12 years old at the time I was there. I have just one memory from that event. And that is of being at the dance, which was in the gym at uh, Swami College. It's now Finlandia University. And I remember being up in the bleachers and, and looking down and seeing my mother dancing the polka. And I, I don't know that I even knew she could dance. And, and she could dance. She was really kicking up her heels. She was having a great time. And I, I remember also <clears throat> thinking that uh, the man she was dancing with was a, a fighting to keep his head above water, <laughs> but she looked so joyful. And that's, that's a great memory that I have. And, and if someone had told me then in 37 years, you're going to be presenting for FinFest USA here in Hancock, but it's going to be a virtual presentation, I would have had absolutely no idea what you were talking about. So um, fourth generation Finnish American living here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan um, in this area that's known as the Copper Country because of the number of copper mines that once operated here. And that's what drew the Finns over looking for work. And that included my great grandparents. Uh, several years, I returned here to my hometown, Hancock, and I started researching my family history. And uh, that led to my retrieving my grandmother's carpet loom, which you see behind me, um, from the old family farm. I, I didn't know uh, how to weave. I had no idea how the loom worked. My grandma had passed on at that point, but, but of course I was uh, ideally hoping to learn how to, how to use it and how to weave rag roads with it as, as she once had. So I'll tell you what I learned about her history and about her weaving and how I ultimately did uh, learn to weave rag roads with it. And uh, how that then inspired me, I guess, I guess you'd say to unearth some additional family artifacts that, that I'll share with you and uh, artifacts that tied into her weaving and, and also how it led to my taking up an additional traditional form of Finnish weaving, which is known as ruyu. <laughs> um, it, seems, it seems that I always knew that I was of Finnish descent. Uh, I knew that it was my great grandparents who had come from Finland. Uh, we all have eight great grandparents. Seven of mine came over as either children or young adults. And the eighth, uh, my great grandpa, Kala Heikinen, was born in Boston location, just north of Hancock, four months after his parents arrived from Finland. And they all ultimately moved to an area known as uh, Toivola, Toivola, which is about 20 miles here uh, from Hancock. And they all started dairy farms. And so um, growing up, there were lots of uh, cultural identifiers that, that told me we were Finnish. If someone had said, uh, I know I'm, of Finnish descent because, and then fill in that blank. <clears throat> uh, of course, there was sauna. And sauna was something we did on the weekends. It was always a, a separate building somewhere on the property. And inside, it smelled like uh, a combination of cedar and, and wood smoke and uh, ivory soap. And then there was the language. <clears throat> um, all of my grandparents were fluent in Finn. My dad was. Uh, my mom knew enough to get by. And so we heard the language a lot growing up. It was just gibberish to me. I, I largely tuned it out. And now I, I wish so much that I could sit by my grandmother's uh, wood stove one more time in the kitchen and, and listen to the adults talking in the living room. Um, we get a lot of tourists and academics from Finland to our area. And if I'm in a store and I hear people uh, speaking Finn, I try to discreetly follow them around for a while so I can hear that language um, being spoken again. And there were the foods. Both my grandmas were wonderful cooks. Uh, 
they made a lot of the traditional popular Finnish foods and, and we, uh, me and my siblings, we knew the, the Finnish names for those foods. And um, music, the music. There was a TV show out of Marquette on uh, TV6. It was called Suomi Kutsu or Finland Calling. And my family would tune into it uh, religiously on Sundays. My dad would turn the volume on the TV up so high that the windows would rattle, the house would shake, and you had no uh, choice but to listen to it wherever you were. And, and then that same music would be played at family reunions and at the community picnics that would be at the Stanship, uh, Stanton Township Park in Toibola. Um, waltzes, shadishes, polkas. And then there were rag rugs, uh, rag rugs. <laughs> so I knew that they were homemade. I knew that my grandmother was a weaver of them. Uh, and I also knew that the Finns in particular had an affinity for them, but I largely tuned them out. Uh, it wasn't until I was entering my forties, entering middle age, uh, that's generally when the first seeds of, of nostalgia start to plant, and that was true for me. Um, I started to take uh, quite an ardent interest in my roots and in my, my Finnish American heritage. Um, but it's also a common enough story that by the time that happens, a lot of the people that you have questions for and, and whose stories you want to hear, they passed on at that point. And that was true for, for my, um, my grandma. And I'm talking about my, my paternal grandmother, my dad's mom. Um, when I think about the conversations she and I would have, we never talked about her weaving. I don't even recall ever seeing the loom. I don't recall ever being brought out to the building that she rolled in. When um, I think about our conversations that we had, it was usually about about uh, what was going on for me in high school and then later in college and, and then beyond that as a teacher. And I think that was also true for my, my female first cousins, um, for her granddaughters, that she was, she was very intrigued by our lives as young women because our lives have, were so different from what hers had been. And, um, so as far as, as her story, a lot of the information I'm gonna share with you today, I actually um, received from my dad who was, still, who was still around at that point. So uh, I wanna make sure I cover everything. I've got some notes here. Um, so my grandma, my grandma Lillian, uh, she was born Lilia, but of course they Americanized their names. So most people called her Lillian or Lily. Um, so Lilia Wiedemann, she was born on her parents' homestead in Misery Bay, Michigan, which you can think of Misery Bay as just a, a suburb of Togola. And she uh, went through school two months into seventh grade, and then she left. Um, very common for farm kids of that generation. They figured seventh, eighth grade was enough education to go out and get work. And then she helped with chores on the farm until she was old enough to uh, go to town for work. And, and then she was a waitress for a while. And also she worked as a cook's assistant in a boarding house. She married my grandpa Vilho Vitala in 1930, right at the start of the, the Great Depression. And uh, he also grew up in Misery Bay on his parents' homestead. So they knew of each other though he was six years older than her. And they acquired eight acres, about eight acres, also in the Toivola area. And, and they started what today we would call a hobby farm. They kept a couple of cows, a couple of pigs every year for meat, chickens, very large gardens. Uh, my grandpa worked in the logging camps as a, a teamster, which means he, he drove the horses that, that pulled the logs out of the woods with chains. And in off season, he would get jobs, odd jobs as a carpenter. So um, not a lot of money, but they lived very, I say they lived their entire lives deliberately simple. They, they didn't have a lot of wants, so they didn't need a lot of money. And uh, I think if they had had to move to town, I think that would have been the death of them. They, they loved their simple, 
country life. And um, they had three children then during the depression, including my dad. Um, they built a log home, a very tiny house. It was a single room downstairs, uh, 12 feet square inside. And then there was a loft above with the, the slope ceilings. And that's where this family of five slept. And not long after that, they did add on uh, a narrow side kitchen, but even then it was very cramped quarters uh, for, for this family. And um, my dad said though that, that they, never, they never really um, thought they were different that way because a lot of their neighbors lived in a similar fashion. It wasn't until he started high school when he went to Jeffers High School in Painsdale that he started to get to know some of the town kids and, and see how they lived. But even then, the country kids and, and the town kids kind of stayed separate. They had their separate cliques. Um, so, oh, and, and the house, um, my great grandpa Eric Vitala helped to build it. And uh, people who are from the Toivola area might be familiar with the fact that his house is, is still standing as well. And, and I'll show you some photos of that uh, towards the end. So Lillian, um, she knew how to weave from a young age. Her mother had a loom for a period of time and she had sisters-in-law that had looms and neighbors. So there were plenty of, of them for her to practice on. And she always wanted one of her own, but um, they certainly wouldn't have fit in that tiny house. And she also, for her weaving, she didn't want it to just be a hobby. She wanted to actually turn it into a business. And, and she didn't feel she would have the time for that until the kids were grown. And uh, that time came around 1950. And there was a building on the property that my grandpa had built in the early 40s, I believe, late 30s, early 40s. It was a very neat little log building that um, instead of the square logs like the house had, they were rounded logs. And this was meant as a, a playhouse for the kids. But once they were grown, this then became the building that my grandma was going to uh, weave in. And this playhouse then became known as, officially as the carpet shack, which was a tongue in cheek name for it because there was, there's nothing shack like about it. It's, it's a very well built, very, very cool little building. And they, um, oh, she bought, her union 36, union number 36, uh, two harness floor loom. It's a simple loom. And uh, they set it up inside. They ran an electric line to the building. So she had an outlet and she had lighting. And um, they brought in a manual sewing machine. And then uh, there was also a small wood stove inside. So she could comfortably weave through the winter, which is when she would have had the most time for it. And um, she built up her business through word of mouth. Once people learned that she was weaving rag rugs, uh, all of the orders started coming in from not just local uh, people, but really from around the country as far as California and actually a lot of relatives that had moved out to California. And so if um, someone uh, that she knew, a, a relative bought a rug in California and, and then they had it on their floor, and someone came to visit and saw that carpet. Well, then they said, where'd you get it from? Well, Lillian back in Toivola, Michigan. And then there were people she didn't even know who were sending in requests for rugs. Um, she also had a standing order for a period of time at uh, a hardware store in South Range, which is between Hancock and, and Toivola. And she sold them there on consignment and they were willing to take as many rugs as she was willing to provide them. So, this very quickly became a nice uh, additional source of income for my grandparents, which was the plan. And uh, in terms of what uh, she had to put out for um, supplying materials, there was the warp string that she was constantly replenishing on my loom right now, the warp string, uh, you see it hanging down in bundles there. So um, there was that, and then there was thread to sew the, the rag strips together. but Beyond that, um, she really didn't have that many costs. The, the actual rag materials, right? Rag ball, we call this in a we call it the weft. 
Um, as far as the rags went, again, as people found out that she was weaving, they were more than happy to donate to her their cast off clothing and, and bedding and curtains, whatever fabrics they had that they no longer had use for. Um, my dad, my dad actually said that there were times where so many donations were coming in at once that it would get overwhelming for her. <clears throat> and that was because, partly because she felt uh, before she could store them away, she needed to wash them. And, and washing them meant using the ringer washer out in the sauna and then hanging them to dry before uh, she packed these materials away. And uh, my dad also said that as she was going through the donations, if she found something that, that she liked the look of and, and that was still in good shape and fit her, that she would actually incorporate some of those pieces into her wardrobe. And, and he found that embarrassing, but, but either she didn't care or she kept very close track of who donated what and made sure that she wasn't wearing their pants if they showed up for coffee. And uh, some of those clothes are still out there. Uh, and I brought some to show you today. And uh, she, her period of weaving, she wrote, she wove prolifically from the early 1950s until the early 70s. Uh, and, and so these clothing are, are clearly vintage. And uh, this is one, this is a woman's blouse. And we've got a very um, loud pattern going on here, very vibrant colors. And, and you have the really large collar on it. It's still in fabulous shape. All the buttons are still intact. And lots of pairs of women's polyester elastic waist pants uh, with the check pattern, various colors. And some of them have the, like this pair, have the bell bottom cuffs. And my understanding is that bell bottoms are coming back in fashion. So I may hang on to these and maybe I'll be incorporating them into my own uh, wardrobe. And, and they also, they, um, they smell musty, but they also still smell like laundry detergent. And so I'd be curious what brand she was using. And if that brand uh, still exists, I could write to them and, and commend them on how, uh, how potent of a product they had. Maybe they do an advertising campaign based on this. So we could have a vintage fashion show with these clothes. And, uh, and on the topic of storing things away, so she stored a lot of things away. Um, my dad kind of made fun of that, that, that my grandparents kept everything. Um, he credited it to the, the Great Depression, having raised children through the Great Depression. But I think, I think it goes back many generations back into Finland uh, with, with our ancestors being peasantry and, and being poor. And so you saved, you saved things. Um, another thing that she saved, and this is one of the things that once I started weaving and, and uh, delving into the, the carpet shack, one of the other things I found were hundreds and hundreds of letters that she had kept. Uh, letters that people had written to her during the same time period early 50s to early 70s. And I think uh, she kept those letters because they were uh, a record for her of this business that she had had. And she stored them in uh, these large metal canisters that were labeled as 100 pounds of lard. And I'm thinking she, she may have gotten them from the Toibola lunch restaurant and cleaned them out really well. Show you one. You've got 100 pounds of snowball shortening. They come with the lids. So she was cleaning. Oh, and someone had asked me, how many pasties can you make from this amount of lard? A lot. So she, she placed the letters inside those canisters and, and they did get musty. Um, I, I say I don't have allergies, but, but I do have to go outside as I'm reading these. I read a few every so often. I've got lots to go. <clears throat> so they're very musty, but I'm going to share uh, a few of these with you today just to give you an idea of, of what's being written to her. Um, 
some people really vague when they were requesting carpets, but other people were very specific in terms of what they wanted. I think if someone was vague, she certainly would have followed it up with a, a phone call or letter. But this is a woman uh, named Carol who's writing from California. And she tells my grandmother, I would like you to make three sets each with a 36 inch carpet and a matching 18 inch carpet. Sue wants a set, Ed wants a set. And then in parentheses, he likes shades of blue, but not dark like navy. And then, uh, and I want a set. And then, and you know, I like brown, orange and aqua mixed. Sue's colors can run in greens with maybe gold, orange or white contrast. I know you have to work with what you have. Next letter, tell me how much they'll cost and I'll send the money plus postage. So this woman is wanting my grandma to mail her six rugs to California. Um, that was unusual. In most instances, people uh, would say that they were coming up the following summer and they would pick them up or they knew someone who was going to be in the Toivola area and they'd say, hey, could you swing by the Wheatalas and, and get my, my carpets for me? And also, when um, you look at the number of colors that's mentioned in this one letter, there's blue, brown, orange, aqua, green, gold, and white, seven different colors being mentioned. And that's where all of those donations of, of rag material um, became very important for if she was going to, to uh, keep her customers happy. And when uh, she refers to a rug that's shades of blue, that is why my grandma made so many um, hit and miss rugs. And by that, it means you could take many different colors of blue, but not dark like navy, many different colors of blue, and you could piece them all together into a, a single rug. This is hit and miss, but of course, it's not just one color shade, but it's just piecing many different uh, fabrics together into a carpet. And so, yeah, she needed, she needed uh, lots of rag material. And one of her most enthusiastic providers of rags early on was her sister-in-law, Jingo. And uh, some people watching today are likely familiar with Jingo Vito Labashan. She wrote three books about growing up uh, on the homestead in Toivola. She was my grandpa's youngest sister. And if you're familiar with their stories, they're humorous stories, but they also provide a lot of insight into what it was like for the first and second generation um, growing up down there. And in, in her fashion, how she words things, she's writing in 1951. Uh, she tells my grandma that those carpet rags are packed like sausages in burlap sacks and someone can come and pick them up and, and bring them to you. And then a couple months later, she's writing again and she had been in the hospital. She may have been, she may have had a baby um, and she had had a babysitter that was looking after her kids. She wasn't pleased with the babysitter. So she writes, I had more carpet rags in a big bag. And when I wasn't home, the kids dug the clothes out and dressed in them and left them dragging all over the woods. That girl let them do anything they wanted. Uh, I had to work for a week finding them all over outside and washing them again. And was I mad? And then what she says after that is inappropriate. So I'm not going to uh, read beyond that. <laughs> and, uh, and then her sister, Signe, her sister, Signe is writing from California. And she tells my grandmother, I, I wanna let you know that I mailed the carpet rag packages last Friday, and I'll be mailing one more package next week if the train strike doesn't get underway. So she's mailing carpet rag material from California to my grandma. But also my grandma is sending her some things in return because she also says to her, um, I received a package of Maltex boxes and gazettes and made some burua for myself this morning. So my grandma is sending her boxes of Maltex cereal, which makes me think was Maltex a Midwest thing because you not find it in the stores in California. So she's making some hot cereal, some burua. And then also my grandma's sending her gazettes. So she's referring to the Daily Mining Gazette, which uh, is our local paper, so that Flora or Sydney could keep up on the, on the news, the local news. 
And I wondered um, also, oh, and I should say there's also a tremendous amount of gossip in these letters. The, the most um, popular topics, who's sick and what are they ailing from? And then also who's getting divorced, which is you know, the cardinal sin. And, and then I wondered, what was my grandma charging for her rugs? And I've only found one piece of evidence so far, and I find it hard to believe. And that is from a woman named Betty, who is requesting a rug from her in 1970. And she, she tells her what she wants. And at the end, she says, I, at $1.50 a yard, $1.50 a yard, your beautiful work is worth much more than that, and an exclamation point. So $1.50 a yard, 50 cents a foot. Uh, if you adjust that for inflation to today's dollars, that's about $3.80 a foot. And if someone's ordering a pretty standard four and a half foot rug, that's selling for about $17. And my grandma was making some really nice carpets. They were well-made. Uh, $17, it, Today, that would be like highway robbery. And it's not that the customer is paying too much. It's that my grandma's not being paid enough for her rugs. So either, either that's what they were going for at the time. Um, I hope she did market research. Uh, or maybe people are buying them and then selling them for profit. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, or maybe this just is not accurate. And as I go through more letters, um, I might find some additional evidence as far as what she was actually charging. Uh, for the carpets. And uh, her rugs. So this one, I have six. Uh, I have six of her carpets that I have uh, located so far. And my favorite is, is this one because to me, and the light's gonna bounce a little bit, I apologize for that. But for me, this is the quintessential rag rug because of the fact that when, if we go back even, let's say to my great grandparents' time when, when rag rugs were being made, cloth wasn't that easy to come by. And, and so you were really piecing together rugs from scraps. And, and this rug is truly made from scraps. I, I measured a, a four inch uh, long section and I counted how many different strips of fabric we're in that four inch section and then just extrapolated it for the, the length of the rug. So there's over a thousand, there's, there's truly over a thousand pieces of fabric that are in this rug. And I'll try and maybe give you a better view of the full length. And very narrow strips. Uh, the the um, fringe is of course getting tattered as it gets old. The colors aren't gonna quite come out for you today as vibrant as they are, but oh, it's not too bad. But that's, that's my favorite. Of, I think of the amount of work that went in to, to making this one carpet that she put into this one. And then uh, <laughs> this carpet, was still on the, the floor in the change room of our sauna as of two years ago, which is when I realized uh, we need to be preserving these carpets. And so this one, this one I brought home and, and then I made one myself to replace it. And very long, I don't think I can even, my arms aren't gonna be able to quite get the full length on this. But again, you've got your hit and miss in various, uh, colors and still in good shape. All the warp strings are still intact. Everything is still in one piece. It's just that the, the fringe, oh, the fringe is getting quite worn on it. My rugs, I'll show you one of those right now simply because this is the one I, I made to replace the, the sauna rug. So uh, this one is hit and miss. What was my inspiration? The Finnish flag. It's hard to find the blue that's in the Finnish flag though. And this is made uh, from curtains and from, from bed sheets that I found at uh, local thrift stores. It's important to me that when I'm making, if you're making a rag rug by definition, you're using 
you're using cloth that fabrics that have been cast off from their original purpose, right? Uh, you're recycling. And so whenever I make a rug, it's going to be from materials that, that uh, I'm giving a, a new life to. So here's our new Stauner rug. And then I uh, have one like this that has seen some significant damage and it's seen damage on uh, both ends. You've got a lot of snapped warp strings. Um, what can you do with this? Uh, a couple of things. One is to remove the, remove the weft up until you get to where the damage is. And then, uh, cut the excess warp string off, and then you can do something like I did here, which was to braid the, the warp string and uh, tie off knots. And the result then, so this is one of my grandma's carpets, and here we have lighter colors, pastels. It was quite a bit longer, uh, and I'm sorry that the colors are gonna drown out with the light, but on one end, well, actually on both ends, she had finished it off without a fringe. She had tucked um, or sewed under the header, but on this side, there was so much damage. And so I just removed up to the damaged weft and did the knotting. Two different finishes, so what? Uh, it's in one piece now. And then I read, I happened to come across an article uh, on the net, you can look it up. It's under the, the Norwegian textile newsletter. And there was a recent article there about a woman who took one of her grandmother's damaged rugs and she removed the weft. So this is actually weft that came off of that pale one I just showed you. Um, it's very dented uniformly because of the warp strings that I've been pushing down on it over the years. I kept it though, because it's, it's so cool. It's beautiful. There's got to be something else I can do with it. Well, reading this article in the Norwegian textile newsletter, this woman took the weft from her grandmother's damaged drug and she just directly transferred it onto a uh, new warp string. And in doing so, she she resurrected her grandmother's rag rug. She recreated it. So you can you can Google that and look that up and read about that. So there's another idea with what you can do with the damage drug. Um, my grandpa, once my grandpa retired from the logging camps, my grandma put him to uh, to work in the winter time she would give him a pair of scissors uh, and she would, his job was to cut up the clothes into, into the, the rag strips, into the rag strips. And uh, she would then sew them end to end and together they would, they would roll them up into the rag balls. Um, she even included it in his obituary that, that he enjoyed helping her with, with making uh, her carpets, whether or not that's true, I don't know. Uh, but he, um, he passed away in 2000 at the age of 95. He had lived the last few years of his life in a nursing home. Um, my grandma, she passed four years later at the age of 93. Um, she, she lived at home right up until about the last month of her life. And she lived the last seven years of her life alone in that tiny house uh, on a dead end road. She didn't have a car, never drove in her life. The only source of heat in the house was wood, two wood stoves. So she's in her nineties and she's still feeding these two wood stoves uh, and, and going through the winter. So uh, we could say that she was very, she was very strong she was very independent. And, and we think of those as typical um, finished traits. And then once, um, once she died, the property stayed in the family, but <clears throat> everything was just locked up and left. And, and that uh, included the carpet check in the loom. So uh, jump ahead, jump ahead 10 years. I, I was 
back here in Hancock. I was back living at home. And I was starting to go through uh, 4,000, about 4,000 family photos, uh, organizing them, putting them into sleeves and then into binders. And uh, 4,000 photos, that's, that's quite a project. Uh, I, was, I was happy that, I mean, why wouldn't you be that your relatives took so many pictures? Um, they're recording not just my family's history, but also the, the history of the Finnish Americans, uh, the history of Tobola, history of the Copper Country. But organizing them all, trying to put them all chronological uh, from the late 1800s uh, up until today um, was quite an endeavor. And I had, of course, a lot of questions about some of these photos. Uh, who were these people? Where was this photo taken? You know, approximately what year? And my dad was still here. So I was able to uh, ask him a lot of questions. Where did these photos come from? Uh, both sets of grandparents, my dad's pictures and then my mother's. So combined, this is where I got all these pictures from. And it was when I was going through uh, the photos and talking to my dad, that's when the topic of the loom came up. And I don't remember if it was me who brought it up or it was him who brought it up, but he said, you should drive down. You should drive down and, and take a look at it, take a look inside the carpet shack. And he didn't have to ask me twice. I, um, I went down uh, and again, I, I don't recall ever seeing the loom until that day. And I can say that it was love at first sight. Uh, I knew instantly that I had to have it. Um, I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful antique. It takes up a lot of space, but I've got the room for it. And, uh, and again, it's clearly deeply tied into my family history and also into the history of the Finnish Americans into the culture. And uh, it's a manual machine. It actually does something. It, it creates weavings. And so I knew I had to have it. Um, the problem was that it wasn't going to fit out the door. And I had no idea how it was supposed to come apart. But I came back with tools. Uh, I brought a camera. I took a bunch of pictures of it. I drew some sketches of it. And, and then as best I could, I started to uh, loosen all the nuts and bolts. And, and a couple of times, some heavy pieces came crashing to the floor. And I'm lucky that nothing broke. Uh, but got it all um, hauled home and, and put back together. And uh, again, I, I didn't know how the loom worked. Uh, and so it was kind of guesswork if, if it was done correctly. And, and then it sat here. It sat here in this room as a display piece. Uh, I was happy though that it was safe now. It was preserved. And, and I, did, I did ideally want to learn how to use it, but I didn't know at the time of any lessons being offered in the area. That's really changed, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that. But at the time, I didn't know of anyone offering weaving lessons or courses. And, and again, if I was going to if I was going to learn how to, to weave, I, I wanted it to be uh, hands-on. So that opportunity uh, presented itself unexpectedly. I was taking a, a social dance class at the Finnish American Heritage Center here in Hancock. And we were learning how to shadish and how to waltz and how to polka. And now I know why my mom looks so happy at FinFest. I don't know. Uh, how you can be dancing the polka and not be having a great time. To me, it's like returning to the, the play of childhood. And, and one evening during a break, I was in the hallway of the Heritage Center, which serves as an art gallery. And there was a, a beautiful rag rug on display and I was admiring it. And one of the dance instructors came walking over, uh, Phyllis Fredendahl, and, and she commented on it and, and I said, I told her, well, I have my grandmother's carpet loom and she used to make rag rugs like this. And so uh, Providence, uh, Phyllis happened to be the fiber arts instructor at Finlandia University, uh, again, here in Hancock. If you wanna explore your Finnish American roots, Hancock is the place to be. Uh, and, and she graciously invited me to audit her beginning weaving course, semester long course, 
which was going to be offered the following fall. And, and uh, I, I definitely said, hey, I'm going to take advantage of that. I was the oldest student by about 25 years. And we learned so many things. We learned how to, she showed us how to knit and how to crochet. And, and that just tied my brain in knots. But we also learned how to use a variety of uh, different looms and how to, um, how to dress the loom, which is a time consuming and very exacting process. And that dressing the loom refers to taking uh, all those warp strings. In this case, there's over 240 warp strings on this loom. And you have to very carefully feed them through tiny holes uh, in what's, what are called the heddles on the harnesses, if you know the lingo of a loom, and then uh, through the holes, the dents on the reed. If you don't do it correctly, you get threading errors in all your rugs. So uh, that's an intimidating thing, but I learned how to do that in the class. And, and then also how to prepare the, uh, the, the weft, the, the rags for, for the weaving. <clears throat> and uh, before the class was even was even uh, over, I I came home and I got my my loom set up. I got it dressed. I got it ready for weaving. I couldn't wait to to try it out. And uh, again, wanted to make it from from repurposed fabrics. So I went to a local thrift store and checked out the the bedding. Um, I found three three flat bed sheets in vintage prints. I love vintage prints. I love vintage, not necessarily this, this print, but love vintage prints. And uh, the sheets were pink and yellow. Uh, my favorite colors, God, no. Uh, do they match my decor in my house? Nope. So this wasn't exactly something that was really well planned out. I just wanted to make a rug. And I cut them into strips, but I didn't use scissors. I used something that I saw for the first time at the weaving class. And uh, it's this, which is a table mounted rag cutter. This is an antique. It, um, you mount it on the edge of a table, you turn the crank, and then you've got your two cutting wheels that, that spin and you feed your cloth through. You can adjust the width. You feed your cloth through and it cuts it into strips for you. And I found this right around that same time at, again, a local thrift store for $20. And it even came with an extra cutting wheel. So um, quite a deal. And I also say that you, you know you live in a Finnish American community and something like that is, is in your thrift store. So I got all of the sheets cut up into strips and I've told this story before. Once I got started, my, my world shrunk to an area about four and a half feet wide directly down in front of me. The rest of the universe just faded away. I was so excited to finally be realizing this dream. And I was having so much fun. And that first night, I felt like I wasn't alone in this room. I felt like my ancestors were here with me, uh, not just Lillian, but uh, I could envision them. Um, people sitting and standing around the perimeter, holding cups of coffee with saucers and leaning over, talking to each other, uh, talking about their weaving, commenting on what I was doing and, and mostly good things to say, nothing too critical. And I felt uh, so much um, encouragement from, from that feeling of their presence. And I woke for about maybe three hours that night and then the next day, the next day uh, woke well, for several more hours. And again, I was so absorbed in what I was doing. I'm, uh, this is a painted pine floor in here. And uh, at one point, my back was really starting to, to ache. And I thought, okay, I've got to, I have to take a break. So I went to stand up straight, stretch my back out. And I was shocked to find that I had, uh, across the room. I had started in this corner and now I was over in the other corner of the room. And it, it both me and the loom had very, very slowly walked across the room together. And that was because every time you bring the, the beater bar forward to, to beat down a row of weft, there's that force coming towards you. 
and and so the loom was slowly shifting but I was standing I was just staring down and I just kept adjusting my stance and had no idea this was going on but that tells you how how uh into how, how wrapped up I was in in making this rug so when I finished um how did I know when I was done I just thought well that's enough and and then I cut it free from the loom I couldn't wait. I was so excited to show it to, to Phyllis. And I posted it to my Facebook for my friends to see. Uh, I brought it to show my dad. And, and I still wonder to this day if he actually believed that I made that rug. Uh, he seemed a little incredulous that, that first off I made it and then also that I had, I had made it on his, his mother's loom. And uh, so that first carpet, the colors are going to drown probably as I come back, but oh, it's not too bad. So there's your link. And not, I wouldn't say it's a hit and miss, and I wouldn't say it's a pattern. I was just kind of playing around. Um, so you've got your, yeah, your pinks and your yellows. And I was happy in that it had a, a uniform width stand back. So it had a uniform width over the full length. Uh, you can use a, a tool called a, a temple or a stretcher to ensure that that happens. I've never used one. Um, maybe I should, but I, I didn't. And so I, I had a uniform width and it's also a very tight weave. So it's going to be a durable rug. Happy about that. A couple things I, I wouldn't, well, a few things I wouldn't have done. Probably not these colors again, although you don't see a lot of pink and yellow rag rugs, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's good. Uh, and then the yellow. I, I shouldn't have done a yellow header. If you're going to do a colored header, it should match your uh, your warp. And so I wouldn't have done that. Uh, and then also when I cut the the warp strings, uh, drowning out color. When I, I cut the warp, I cut it too short. And when I went to tie these knots, my, my hands were cramping and my fingertips were starting to really ache. So now I know to, to cut the, the warp a little longer before, before I start tying the, the knots on the fringe. And so you learn from your mistakes, right? And you don't do that again. And then after that, well, I was inspired, I was inspired to go back down to the, to the carpet shack because I knew there were lots of things she had um, she had tucked away there, uh, weaving supplies. And that included a lot of rag balls. So I brought a bunch of those home and I made two more carpets using these rag balls that, that she and possibly even my grandpa had, had made together. And the, um, the first one, is uh, this rug that the, um, the rag balls themselves, I know were uh, old blankets. And the reason I know they are blankets is because the labels that were sewn onto the blankets by the manufacturer were sewn right into the rag balls. They weren't removed. And uh, the blankets were a chunky weave, um, kind of a loose weave. And so the, the carpet has that, that same quality. And I like it because when I walk on it, it massages my feet, <laughs> it's lumpy. And my cats love it because I have hardwood floors and in the winter when I put it down on the floor, they, they like to nap on this because it's warm. But with this, I did do the, the um, striping pattern. I, I was carefully measuring out the sections so that I would get this overall look to it. And then, uh, and then the other one I made from, from rag balls, there were two, two that were, there was one that was red that was felt and one that was black, solid color felt. And then there were four or five that were clearly made from um, worn out men's final shirts. And, and so this rug was made from those materials, those rag balls. And I think, I think this would be a good one, and this is hit and miss, right? So I think this would be a good one for putting on a floor at a hunting camp, but I haven't had the heart yet 
to, to give it to someone to allow them to do that. Not quite yet. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you for for uh, for rogues today. Uh, so I want to get to a couple other things. Um, so yeah, 40 years of my life, I, I never paid much attention to to rag rugs. I certainly do now. Um, weavers are artists. I understand that. I understand that now. Weavers are artists. They are creating. Uh, every rug they create is a work of art. And I know my grandma was commended for for her skill for her talent by the people who understood that at the time but it, it took me it took me uh, until I was you know around 40 years old to catch on for her granddaughter to catch on uh, and then how one thing can lead to another um, I got involved obviously in weaving because I wanted to make rag rugs but I also was introduced uh, in this weaving course to other forms of, of weaving. And, and one of those is another uh, traditional form of weaving in Finland, which is known as ruyu. People say, oh, how do you say that? <laughs> ruyu. And they say, well, how do you spell it? And I, I say, well, R-Y-I-J-Y. -Y. It's spelled just like it sounds. But unless you're familiar with the Finnish language, you think I don't know what I'm talking about. In Sweden, it's also still popular and it's, it's known as Raya, uh, R-Y-A. And so that's what most of the world calls it. Uh, much easier to, to remember that and to say that. So uh, with when you're making a, a ruyu, when you're making a ruyu, you're not using, you're not using uh, strips of, of cloth like you would for a rag rug. Instead, you're using bundles of, I'm gonna fade out, I'm gonna do different color, bundles of um, yarn. Short lengths of yarn, you could use anywhere, maybe three to five pieces of yarn in a bundle, depending on the, the thickness of the yarns. And you're tying them into a, a knot along the warp strings. You, you can do this using your, your typical, um, boom and depending on how far apart the warp strings are generally like every four warp strings you're going to tie a knot and then the next four warp strings again a knot all the way across and each of those bundles of yarn acts like a color pixel so you can actually create imagery it's not exacting imagery but um, it's a little abstract but you get the idea and and of what of what it is uh, you're shooting for so my first ruyu I, I had taken a picture of uh, peeling birch bark, a, a close-up picture of white birch. When it peels back, it has that peachy color underneath. And what I did then is took that photo and really just directly transferred that image onto, onto the loom, onto the warp. And this is then what resulted. And that measures about two by three feet and I like to say that with reuse they're reversible pieces because if you look at the back you can turn around it's it's very cool on the back as well and if you look on the front if you go back to the front you can see how those bundles of uh, yarn end up creating kind of like a shag carpet it's a it's a really plush um, luxurious uh, plush that results. And people always say, can I touch that? Yes, you can. And on the back, when you look on the back up close, you start to get an idea of what's taken place to create it. Because each of these bundles is a knot that was tied. Um, what type of knot is it? it? You could look it up. One, one name for it is the Turkish knot. And so you tie a row of knots, you beat that down, and then you add these rows of what is just called plain, plain weave, plain weft, um, like four or five rows shots of, of yarn. You beat that down, that adds strength to the piece and it reduces the number of knots you have to tie. For this ryu, I, uh, for each row, there's 53 knots. 
And the total number of knots on this piece, I memorized 3,922. And I timed, uh, I kept track of my time. It took me about 60 hours to, to weave this. Uh, you don't have to make a review this size, um, but I can say that I, I enjoyed this so much. Uh, to me, weaving a review is the ultimate form of meditation and it's fun and it's creative, but it's not as well known here uh, in the States as rag rugs for several reasons, right? They're, they're not as practical. Um, people had rags to make a rug, but if you had a skein of wool yarn, most of these are made from wool yarn. You weren't going to make something like this. You were going to knit a pair of socks or, or mittens. Uh, you were going to be practical. And you're not going to spend 60 hours on the homestead or farm making a ruyu. You're going to spend a, a much smaller amount of time making a rag rug. And then when you're done with this, are you going to throw it on the floor? No. <laughs> no. Where's a rag rug? Sure, throw it on the floor. So though the immigrants who came here knew, they were familiar with ruyu. They, not that many made them because of, again, the practical reasons. Um, but I really want to see uh, the Ryu grow in popularity here because I, as much as I enjoy it, and so that's why I want to mention it today, and, and I'd love also to not only promote it, but also help to teach people how to make them. And uh, let's see, I'm running, I know I'm running, checking the clock here on my time. <laughs> Okay, one last piece. Uh, this, is, um, this is something I just refer to as a sampler. The, uh, the materials I used were mostly, again, from the carpet shack. And, and so the colors here aren't necessarily the colors I wanted. They were just the colors I, I, was, I had to work with. And, and this was just for fun, doing a variety of things. Um, just step back so you can see the full length of it. So this is, this is something that would hang on the wall. And I call this past and present for a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of the materials are from the past. Right? These, are, these are things my grandma had prepared. And, and also it's taking the form of weaving that, that she practiced, right? the, the rag rug weaving. And it's taking this other form of weaving that I've also become familiar with that she did not uh, partake in, which is the Ruyu, and bringing them together, the past and the present. And if I'll show you more detail on it. The, the bottom is um, hit and miss rag rug. This rag ball, there were six of these identical rag balls. And so this is the, the type of rag ball that I used to make this. And if you, if you were to compare them up close, you start to see how they match up. I just took the strips here and cut them a little shorter. And then, uh, and I also took some of these strips and I brought them up into the Ryu. You can see there's the, the red plaid right there. And uh, with Ryu, you don't have to use yarn. You can use uh, lengths of fabric. You can use chenilles, which is what's going on here with the white as a chenille. So you have a section of Ryu up above. Uh, at the top here, I've got the rag rug that is the, the striping pattern instead of just the hit and miss. Did my grandma also do a uh, pattern rag rug? She did, but, but I don't have any examples of them. I can see them, however, in photos. If I look back at some of those 4,000 photos, I can see she also did the, the striping patterns like this. And, um, and then again, I've got another section of the Ryu. And in the middle, um, this is called sumac weaving, and the buttons, <laughs> these buttons all came from the carpet check when you save everything, right? So as my grandma was cutting up the clothes, my grandpa was cutting up the clothes, they, they saved all of the buttons, they saved all the zippers, they saved all the elastics off the clothing. And, and so these are some of, of her buttons. Uh, there's thousands of them, and I, I have them now. So bringing together the, the past and the present. And um, both of these pieces, these that incorporate Ruyu, I, I could have done these on 
on my loom, but I actually made them on a, a vertical loom. This is the horizontal loom. I made them on a vertical loom uh, at the Finnish American Folk School. And I wanna mention them. Uh, the Finnish American Folk School is housed here in Hancock, in Hancock again, uh, at what was the old Portage View Hospital. And now it's known as the, the Judila Center, the Uthila Center. And uh, they have an amazing studio there, the folk school. Uh, also the director of the folk school, none other than Phyllis Fadnall, who not only taught me how to, to weave, but also helped to teach me how to dance. And um, they are regularly offering weaving courses. And they have really created a, a rag rug revival here in our community. It's thanks to them that so many people are taking up the, the weaving of rag rugs uh, and other forms of weaving, but they don't just offer weaving courses. They, um, they have such a variety of, of constantly evolving uh, new, new, there's workshops, there's, there's classes that last a few hours, there's classes that last several weeks. Uh, they, um, I'm thinking about this weekend, they have someone there, I believe, teaching how to play the rhythm bones. You get to make your own pair uh, from, I think, cherry wood, and then learn how to play the rhythm bones. That's fantastic. They uh, have had gondola, gondola lessons, music lessons. Um, they're having online finish. Uh, you can take online finish, beginning finish courses. They have some of the, the things that are going on right now. Uh, and then, oh, if, if you're, you had a grandparent that was a spinner of wool, you can learn how to use a spinning wheel. You can make your own wool yarn, and then you can dye it using natural dyes from plants they grew in the dye garden there at the folk school. So uh, you can check them out. They're constantly bringing in two uh, guest artists as well, and um, what they're doing there is fabulous. And they post under the Heritage Center on Facebook. And they also have an Instagram account and, and you can look them up on the web, the um, Finnish American Folk School. So uh, when am I gonna weave again? <laughs> I'm like my grandma, for me, weaving is more of a winter activity. Uh, our fabulous fall color season is here. I'm gonna enjoy that. And I've got lots of letters I still need to read. And then I think, um, I think I'll go back down to the folk school and and uh, I have an idea for a piece based on my love of Lake Superior that I wanna, I wanna try and uh, see if I can achieve. And uh, the problem for me is that, that weaving is addictive. Once I start, I have a really hard time stopping. It is, it's fun, it's creative. It puts my thoughts through a filter, it's soothing. Um, if I were to say that I'm gonna, I'm gonna start something here on my loom and I'll get back to it this weekend or I'll get back to it, you know, in a few days. That's not how it works. If I, if I walk by this doorway, I am like a piece of iron and my loom is a magnet and it pulls me in and, and I can get in trouble that way. But if I, if I weave at the folk school, if you're a trained weaver, then you can, you can do their open studio hours. And that way I'm limited to one day a week. Uh, and then I look forward to that, to that day all week long. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm a weaver now and I'm proud of what I've done. Um, what a wonderful way to, to connect to my family's history and, and another way to connect to my Finnish American heritage. It, it's brought me so much happiness. Uh, I've met so many great people in the last few years as a result of this. Um, people with truly beautiful hearts and, and they know who they are. <laughs> and uh, people who are also devoted to celebrating Finnish American culture and, and promoting it and preserving it. And, uh, and it's also led to opportunities I never, I never would have uh, anticipated like presenting for, for FinFest USA. And uh, it all came about because my grandma was, was a weaver before me. And, and thankfully her loom was still down there at the farm. If, if those two things weren't true, I don't think I would have become a weaver. And uh, one day I decided to, to drive down and, and to make the loom my own. And then one thing leads to another. And that's what I have. <laughs>
uh, other than photos, I have 4,000 photos I could show you, <laughs> but I, I know we're limited on time. And so I, I have, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe about 10 photos. And I'll see if I can get this to go the way I want here, hopefully. I want to actually um, be able to highlight here. Uh, I've got a couple of options. One is to use an arrow, but that's not working for some reason. So I have to use this red dot, which is uh, a bit aggressive. But anyway, um, and I don't know if on my screen, I have a toolbar in the way. If it's in the way, somebody needs to let me know. So here are my grandparents, Bilho and Lilia. And, and we just called her uh, grandma. We didn't call her Mumu or Mumo or Lillian or Lilia. She was just grandma to us. And also my grandparents were known to us as the folks. If we were going to dinner or going to sound out, we were going to the folks house. We always called them the folks. So Wilho and Lilia. And then uh, you've got my aunt Anna. And then here's my dad, Wilmer. And then my, my uncle Lloyd. So with their three children. And This is their house being built. This is their tiny house. Uh, on the far end, this is my grandpa, Bill Ho. These are a couple of his brothers. It's a man holding a dog. I'm not sure which brothers these are. I would have to study that more closely. I don't know who the man is on this far end, but this man with the, uh, the white mustache, this is my great-grandpa, Eric Vitala. So he... He came to the United States hoping to make a living building log homes, but he found people didn't want them anymore. They wanted timber frame homes, but he was a master woodworker and he also built some beautiful sailboats. One of them, he brought his family from Calumet to Toivoa uh, using one of those sailboats. So um, his house too, I wanna to mention, still stands in Toivoa straight and tall, 122 years later. So there's a house going up. Uh, and this is almost done. You've got some, uh, scaffolding still up. I love the, the car out front. That's either a model, it's got to be a Model T or a Model A, probably maybe a T Ford. I, I don't know my cars that well. but uh, And then this is my grandpa's brother, Vino, who lived two doors down and had a very similar house built right around the same time. So probably the same work crew. <clears throat> and uh, my grandpa kneeling with my aunt Anna, and then my grandma kneeling there as well. And uh, let's see, actually, okay, different angle. And uh, this then, their front door right here, they, they did add on that side kitchen not long after. And, and so then this front door became the entryway to go from the kitchen into, I guess what we would say would be the living room. And there's the house then with the kitchen added on, a new front door and, and the house ready for siding. And here is the, the building that was initially a playhouse my grandpa made for, for the kids and uh, later became the carpet check. And this is my dad. I'm not sure if that's my uncle Lloyd or not, but they're clearly playing cowboys. And try and find photos of my grandma with the carpet check or with her weaving. Right? They didn't take pictures of women doing their daily things. They are engaged in their hobbies. They took pictures of men engaged in their hobbies like hunting and fishing, but not the women. So what do I have? I found this old negative. Uh, the colors are kind of off um, because it is a negative that wasn't stored right. But here she is standing in front of it. Um, she wasn't weaving anymore at that point. I was born in 1973, and by then she, she really wasn't weaving much anymore. <clears throat> I have one photo of her inside the carpet check, and this was taken by a cousin. Grateful to her for that. However, I've been unable to hunt down the original. All I have is this, this grainy scan that, that I found on the internet. And, um, and she wasn't weaving here. This is a staged photo, but you see all the materials there stored behind her and standing at her loom. And this is what it looked like 
the day I went down there to check it out. <clears throat> I actually had swept the floor uh, before I took the picture because it was kind of gross in there. It was gross in there. Um, but you can see everything was pretty much how she had left it. And this is another angle. Um, this is after, of course, the loom had been removed, looking from the back of, of the building towards the, the doorway, just to show you how neat that building is. Uh, and also the bumpers. See these bumpers on the floor? My grandpa installed those so that the loom wouldn't shift as she was um, beating down the weft, which I could use in this room. And here are some of the eyeballs I brought home. Um, these three here are, are those chunky blankets that I used to make that one rug I showed you. And then the spacers that I did in between for, for just some variety was from this really cool cotton um, calico that she put together. And then looking at old photos, uh, wondering about the rugs she made. You know, when you look at pictures, the older the pictures get, the more it's, it's not necessarily the person in the picture that's of greatest interest, especially if you have a lot of photos of someone. This is my grandpa Bilbo. It's what else is in the picture? What's in the background? What's in the foreground? I love the old uh, metal lunch boxes there waiting to be filled. The, the vintage linoleum, but also you see rag rugs scattered in the kitchen, my grandma's rag rugs. And my grandma's could be silly. We appreciated that. That carried through the generations uh, down to today. And, and this photo, you've got the cat and the dog in the rocking chair, and my grandpa's lying on the floor. And this one actually has writing on the back, and it says on the back, no room for grandpa. And uh, Again, three rag rugs on the floor that, that my grandma produced. And, uh, and this is me this is me sitting on the stoop leading from the kitchen into the, the living room. I had a little bit of a drooling prob problem going on there and at that age. And again, you see one of her rag rugs in the background. Um, this is at our house growing up. Again, you know, I'm noticing this now. What kind of rag rugs did my grandma make? What colors, what patterns? So here she did a striping pattern. In, in browns and beiges. And, uh, and there we are. That's uh, Lillian and I. And she always, she'd want us to stand out uh, in her garden if it was growing season. She loved to show off her flowers. And so this is obviously springtime with the tulips and uh, the daffodils and, and the carpet check in the background. And if I asked you what year was this taken and you understand hairstyles, Take a look at my hair. That's that's called big hair spiral perm, and that's that's late eighties, early nineties. So that's probably around nineteen ninety. I was about seventeen years old, and that's it. That's what I got. <laughs> this was absolutely amazing, Lisa. Thank you so 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 much. Um, we've had a few questions come in, um, so I'm going to try to get a few of them out there I've been from the chat and then Anna can maybe also jump in uh, with any <laughs> with any that I missed. Um, there were a couple here. Um, <clears throat> some kind of fell in categories. Uh, so so we've got a couple about just you and do, do you teach do you teach uh, rag rug weaving? Do you sell any of your rag rugs? That sort of thing. Um I, I don't teach. No, I don't teach weaving. Um, I think that's something I'd really enjoy doing someday. I, I'm not a trained artist. Uh, do you have to be to teach weaving? No, I would be happy to offer uh, lessons individually to, to someone. But I, you know, I just have my one loom. I don't have a studio. Um, I haven't pursued that yet. I've considered it. Uh, do I sell? <laughs> that's another thing that... Um, I thought of as someday down the road, uh, maybe not not at present. And you know what? Let me know if I'm not answering your question fully. But but no, I, I don't teach weaving at the moment, and I I don't uh, I, I haven't sold my, any of my rugs yet. I haven't attempted. No. Right, but but I'm hearing a yet there, so so we'll be on not the yet. we'll, we'll no, be on the no, lookout. I'm not, we'll be I'm on not the lookout. Off this. No. <laughs> no. Um, this part of my future the the other thing uh the other kind of category that popped up a little bit was the actual process 
um, about, and, and there were several several questions here, like about how long does it take to create uh, one of these rugs? How wide do you generally cut the strips? Um, how do you weave with a continuous uh, strip like that? And, and so a few, a few questions oh. about kind of uh, some of the process, if you wanted to take a minute or two to walk us through that, that'd be great. Oh my gosh, you should ask me those questions one at a time. I didn't sleep at all last night. <laughs> Go back. Tell me so, the first. One. So, if we start, like, about how long does it take you to to make a rug? Uh, That's a tough okay. question. It's a tough question. You no, know, it is because I don't. I don't. While I timed the ruyu, I, I timed the ruyu because I was so curious. Uh, you know, ruyus take they are time consuming. Um, with a rag rug, I've never timed how long it's taken me. Uh, so I really can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Um, I would say maybe. Oh, and I'd be guessing eight hours. I don't know. I don't know. Next question, please. <laughs> I mean, so so to to follow up a little bit, th these are really hard questions, also because it's going to depend on so many different things, right? It is. And oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, the yeah. the other one was kind of specific about the process, like what what yeah. does that look like in terms of cutting your strips and and okay. prepping all that. There's just something that I want to mention. One of the reasons that I, it wasn't just that, you know, are there rag rug classes available lo locally? I, I wasn't really even trying to find one. One of the reasons was because I was intimidated by, um, I thought that if you're gonna make a rag rug, you have to know how to sew. And I didn't know how to sew. Uh, I, to this day, sewing machines scare me. They intimidate me. Maybe somebody, someday somebody will get me over that, help me with that, but um, I, I, don't know how to sew and so that that kind of held me off well it turns out you don't need to know how to sew to make a rag rug uh there's a couple ways around it and and i actually got these ready today in case someone asked us what you can do is take your rag strips and cut them on a diagonal and then when you lay them on the warp strings you you just slightly overlay them a little bit and and then you beat down that row of weft and uh, it, it leads to a little more whiskering in your final product. Uh, so the purists might frown on that, but I like to say it adds character and, and, uh, and it's an easy way to get around sewing. The other thing you can do, uh, I don't have the tools to demonstrate, but you can, um, you can take and cut a, a, a small slit on the end of, of two of your rags. And then you overlay them again, where the slits ma match up and you, you feed one rag through that that gap, and you 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 tug, and that actually that results in um, it's kind of like the magician who can keep nonstop pulling the the uh, handkerchief out of his pocket. You see those knots? That's created by feeding um, one strip through another where you cut those slits and there may be a way to look that up on the internet that method but so i've joined all these different pieces of fabric together without sewing i've done that by by using that method um so if someone out there is thinking they want to learn how to weave but they're intimidated by sewing good news you don't know you don't need to know how to do that okay uh, what else that's awesome uh, and then we've had a couple in the chat also about clothing um, and and whether or not your grandmother was making clothing um, and and any sort of kind of yeah clothing related weaving sewing anything like that oh well my grandmother was a very uh, accomplished seamstress um, I mean when the kids were growing up she was making all their clothes you can see my my uncle and my dad were wearing even though they weren't twins they were wearing similar outfits all the time because she just would buy the one pattern and make it in two different sizes uh, so, so yeah, she, she was very, again, a, a talented seamstress, but was she doing it as part of, she wasn't, she wasn't weaving any clothing. Let's put it that way. Yeah. No. <laughs> and she was a knitter. She was, she was an accomplished knitter. Yeah. Not me. I, I did see one or two questions um, come in in the chat, um, Lisa, about um, about cutting the strips. And you showed us the the crank table mounted um, cutter. Um, is that how your grandmother cut the strips? 
do you use that currently or how did how did your grandmother cut the strips and how do you cut the strips? She did them with scissors. She just used scissors. And and so if you look at at the strips, they're not perfect. You know, if you look at the edges, they're not perfect like like you see here. I mean, this was cut with this rag cutter. And when you do that, you get you get your perfect straight edges. But if you look at her rags, they're they're not uniform. Um, and so you're not going to have, in, in her case, yeah, they're, they're not all the same width, but, but once it packs down, it all, it all kind of evens out in the, in the rugs. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to. Um, you know, there are courses you can take about learning rugs where it's so scientific now, the way they're cutting, um, they're using, special wheels and graph paper and all sorts of things. And it, it gives you perfection, but to me, a rag rug shouldn't be perfection. Yeah. So anyway, I, I cut for all my rugs. This is what I use. And you can find these on eBay. Um, you can look at, this one is actually, this is a Rigby model and it's referred to as a cloth stripping machine. <laughs> That's what this is. Thank you. Right. <laughs> and there's another question here about uh, about your um, uh, about your journey to um, to uh, feeling comfortable um, and confident in your rug making. About how long did it take from when you um, took your first class to um, to feeling really um, comfortable in your in your skills and and feeling like a competent rug maker? Uh, I, I felt pretty confident that first time to be, to be honest, I really did. Um, you know, I, I told you about the mistakes I made, but I was pretty shocked at how that rug came out. Um, yeah, I, I, it was, it was pretty instantaneous. I'm not saying I make, I'm, I'm, I'm the weaver, but I, I, I'm happy. I was happy right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a good instructor, so. That's so great. Thank you. We've got somebody also wondering if you have a social media account or a place where you share um, and document your work publicly. No. <laughs> no. Uh, geez. You know, again, this maybe someday that might that might start happening. I don't not not at the not at present now. No, my, my few Facebook friends have, have seen my work. That's about it. And I was in a display this summer for Johanna said at Finlandia University. I was part of my, the first, uh, it, what, uh, yeah. I, I can't even think of the word right now because I'm nervous. <laughs> anyway, um, first time having my, my work public, publicly displayed was this summer, so. Awesome. We have a couple couple of questions also about your your grandma again uh, and your family a little bit. Um, one is just uh, again wondering, and, and you mentioned this, I think, um, where where in Finland they originally came from. Your family. Oh well, um, the Wittelas came from from Alavus, uh, very common, like Ostrobothnia, southern Ostrobothnia, Alavus. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've researched all of my, my branches and I, I could give you the names of, of all of all eight of my great grandparents, including their maiden names. Um, off the top of my head there, trying to come up with, with the individual, uh, Suomo Salmi was another one, um, Guru, uh, yeah, I, I know, I know the, the, the provinces or the, the cities that they came from, but mostly the, the southern Ostrobothnia, which is very common, very common. Great. And then one last question as we kind of wrap up here. Um, why did your grandma stop weaving? Well, you know, and I, I, I wish I could ask her that, but I know that she wove very prolifically for 20 years and it may have just been, that's enough. You know, uh, when I was born, she was in her mid sixties. 
and, and yeah, she had been weaving already for 20 years and, and it, it's not like she stopped weaving altogether. She, she would still make carpets off and on for family, but, but not to sell anymore. I, I think, you know, uh, people have a career and sometimes they say that's enough of that. Let's move on to something else. And I, I think that's just, yeah. What, what, what happened with the, the weaving. <laughs> All right, great. Well, we're expecting you to continue for a little while uh and hopefully get like an instagram or something going so we can so we can follow this along publicly um there's a few and I'll, I'll share these with you afterwards but there's some really wonderful comments in the chat um just beautiful stories about people's own uh, experiences about their own families um some yeah. folks who would who would love to to chat with you um individually about some of their work and and um all sorts of stuff so I'll, I'll share that with you but i just wanted to to acknowledge everyone who's been so active and engaged in the chat we really appreciate it it's been a lot of fun um to to follow along um so just to all of you out there don't worry we got gotcha. you we will we will share this with with lisa um and with that, I think we're gonna wrap up. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lisa. This was absolutely incredible to, to see and hear and, and learn uh, about your family story, about your, your own journey and, and the weaving along the way. Just beautiful work. Um, thank you, FinFest. Remember, yeah. we've got another one coming up in October. Uh, yes, October 29th is the next webinar. Um, and also, we're going to be opening registration for FinFest 2023 soon, so keep an eye out for those announcements, but definitely join us again at the end of October for um, our next webinar. Perfect. Oh, you know what? I actually have, there's one final question that's super important. Oh, no. How do you, no, but this is really, how do you wash your rag rugs? Oh, well, uh, yeah, one method is to uh, when you've got a really cold day in the winter is to take them out in the yard and, and to toss some clean snow on them and, and just brush off that snow several times. Uh, what you don't do is throw them in your washer and, and let the, the mechanisms in there tear the warp strings. Um, I have uh, washed them in the bathtub. I have washed a couple in Lake Superior. <laughs> I know in Hell's Thinky they have they have uh, they have washing stations there down a, a, a along the sea where where people can go and do that, um, but with my grandmas, yeah, I I did it in the bathtub and then I just I hung them on a railing to dry. Whether that's appropriate or not, that's what I did. Um, I've never tried the snow method, but that's the one I would probably recommend. That's awesome. That's a beautiful way to end this presentation. Thank you so much. Go out and, and clean your rag rugs, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is, I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Kitos all. Palion. Kitos palion. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks all so right. much for all your stories, Lisa. Right. Yes. Hey, Thank hey. you. Hey, hey. <laughs>